All right, we're in Flip the Classroom video number three. Remember, you need to unplug before we start watching these. That means turn off the cell phones, stop Facebook chatting, stop um, checking Twitter, all that stuff, and focus only on this. All right, today we're talking about the end of World War One. We already covered U.S. involvement in World War One, how the war broke out, and we haven't talked too much about the battles. That's going to come um, when we review the online textbook that we're making as a class. But we're still on the objective talking about the political and military turning points of the conflict. Well, we ended the last lecture talking about how the armistice was signed November 11th, um, 11 o'clock, 1918. 11th day, 11th hour, 11th month. But the problem with the armistice was that Austria-Hungary surrendered, but Germany didn't really surrender. Germany just agreed to lay down their weapons. All right, but again, this makes huge world news. You know, you look at the top of that headline. Um, that kind of gives you the impression that Germany has surrendered. It says Berlin seized by revolutionists. There's a new chancellor begged for order. There's an ousted Kaiser. That was Kaiser Wilhelm, who was the cousin to George and to um, Tsar Nicholas of Russia. But um, remember, this was called the war to end all wars. So people thought when World War One's over, there's never going to be another war again. You know, fortunately, they didn't read the writing on the wall when they made this peace. Um, but again, key thing to remember, it's a ceasefire, not a surrender by Germany. President Wilson thought this was going to be his chance to make his mark on history. He thought that he was going to make the world safe for democracy, and his idea was to achieve what he called peace without victory. Um, he wanted to conclude the war, but not conclude the war in such a way that it was going to completely humiliate one side or the other in order that um, we could have a lasting peace. Um, so he came up with a plan, which he delivered to, in a speech to Congress January 1918. It was called the 14 Points. All right, so you see this plan is already in place by Wilson. Or he's already come up with this plan before the war is even over. Um, and the 14 Points, you're going to need to remember a few of them specifically, but just in general know that it's Wilson's um, ideal way to end the war. But the first five were things that Wilson needs to be addressed so there's never going to be another war. If you look at that, no secret trees among nations addresses that alliance system causes war. Freedom of the seas means everybody should be able to trade wherever they want. Um, try to take down tariffs and other economic barriers. That's something that you know the um, International Monetary Fund and the UN is still working on today. Um, arms should be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. That's you know addressing the cause of militarism, but also that's a kind of tough thing to. Um, to enforce because how are you going to say what's the lowest point consistent with domestic safety? And then number five is going to address imperialism. It says colonial policies should not only consider the interest of the imperialist powers but also the colonial people. Um, you know that's Wilson saying this while at the same time the United States had just taken over um, you know Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines. Um, we had been dominating Cuba making them sign put the Platt Amendment into their constitution so we might have been saying this, but it wasn't always what the U.S. practiced, and that was certainly something that was going to be tough for the British to swallow. Um, 6 through 13 dealt with things like boundary changes. There's a new map after World War I for Europe. Um, I've got there that this was going to be based on self-determination. Remember, part of the whole um, spark that caused the war right away was Gabriel Princip's assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary. It's because a lot of these Serbian nationalists like Princip thought that they needed to have their own country. Or they should have their own nation state. All right, well, the 14th point was the sticker for a lot of Americans that were opposed to the treaty. That called for an international peacekeeping body, which came to be called the League of Nations. And that's kind of like what's well, intended to be kind of like our United Nations today, where it was a place for everybody to meet and discuss whatever their issues that they have are. And hopefully they could settle things in a diplomatic way without going to war. Um, but if you see this cartoon, this was a lot of Americans' view of the League of Nations. You see Uncle Sam's tied up right there. The ribbons tying his hand behind his back are the League of Nations. You see we've got England, foreign nations, European nations, and the Empire of Japan doing this. So a lot of Americans kind of saw that as us losing our sovereignty and losing our autonomy to make decisions for ourselves. They thought that we would be forced into making decisions that other countries wanted us to make. All right, but the peace is negotiated by work called the Big Four. I've got Woodrow Wilson from the U.S., George Clemenceau from France, David Lloyd George from Great Britain, and Vittorio Orlando from Italy. 
And there's a picture of the big four right there. You can tell Wilson over on the far right in that picture kind of towers over the others. A um, little bit closer up image of that. But, you know, Russia is not on this list. And it's interesting. Russia, you know, they were a major player on the Allied side. Remember, they were the country that was coming at, or the forces coming at Germany from the Eastern Front. Well, they pulled out of the war when Vladimir Lenin, that guy you see in the background of that little image there, the gray head, led the Bolshevik Revolution to turn Russia into a communist country. All right, he overthrew that um, representative government that led for a very brief time after overthrowing the Tsar. But this caused the Allies to kind of resent Russia. Russia actually had made a separate peace treaty called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the Soviet Union, excuse me, with the Germans. So they were kind of out of the war. So even though they were semi on, I guess, what you could call the winning side, the Allies, they were still, you know, kind of shunned at the peace treaty. But Lenin saw this as a moot point. You know, communism believes that the whole world is going to, like, kind of degenerate into class warfare, where it's going to be like the rich versus the poor. So he thought any war in the meantime was just kind of a waste of time. All right, but as some of the results of the Treaty of Versailles, first off, we got nine new nations established. Um, some of the main ones that I've got there, three of the main ones, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. Um, if you look in the top left, you see a map of Europe, 1914, at the start of World War I. In the bottom right, you see a map of Europe at the end of World War I. Um, some of the significant changes, if you look right here, this is going to be called the Ottoman Empire. It's what they used to call Turkey. Now it's officially called Turkey. You notice Russia in 1914 is called Russia. The end of World War I is called the Soviet Union. And one of the real big changes is you look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire right here, that beige area in Central Europe, has broken up. And now we have a little bit more self-determination. Um, Iraq is on the map too. You know, right here, what we would call Iraq is called Persia. And it's not in this image, but it's called Iraq at the end of the war. All right, a few other provisions of the treaty. And these are the things that you need to really focus on. And I'm hoping that the group that has this for their online textbook will keep these in mind. Um, the group that has the post-war peace. All right, it barred Germany from maintaining an army. Germany is not allowed to have an army at all. And remember, you got to keep in mind that the Germans did not surrender. So they, they thought they should be an equal partner in making this peace. Germany was required to return the territory of Alsace-Lorraine to France. Going back to this last slide, some area right between Germany and France that had been changing hands back and forth between those countries for about 100 years over intermittent wars between the two. And I've got that Germany was required to pay $33 billion in reparations to the Allies, war, um, basically war damages. So think if you're a German at this point. You know, you just struggled for four years of trench warfare and you signed a peace treaty that you thought was just something to make a last make a peace not necessarily a surrender and yet the allies are demanding all these things of you in the treaty of versailles and one thing i don't have on here additionally germany was forced to give up all of their colonies i remember the imperial race for colonies was a big um to do in europe at this time well this peace treaty is signed at versailles which there's an image of it right there you hopefully you remember from world history that's a palace just outside paris it's almost a palace it's like a small city uh, it was built by king louis the 14th of france the sun king it was like five football fields long and uh, i think a football field and a half across so like it, it's a big thing um, it was signed in the hall of mirrors right here but Obviously, there were some weaknesses to this treaty. It humiliated Germany. It even contained a war guilt clause where they basically had to say they had sole responsibility for starting the war. If you remember your video from two nights ago, it was kind of tough to say who started the war because you know everything kind of happened through the failure of diplomacy pretty quickly in 1914. Um, and again, I've got there, Germany was stripped of their co um, colonial possessions. And Russia, like I said, was ex um, excluded from the peace negotiations. They lost more territory than Germany did, or what's called the Soviet Union now. Also, there may have been a little bit of territorial change, but the major claims of self-determination were largely ignored. Um, there was a lot of opposition to this treaty, not only throughout um, Germany, but throughout the United States. Right there you see a guy we're going to talk about a lot coming up, Herbert Hoover. Um, Herbert Hoover was going to be president in 1928. He's the guy that gets kind of labeled the 
bad guy, I guess, at the start of the Great Depression. But he was the Secretary of the Foods Administration, or head of the Foods Administration during World War I, making sure that America had enough food for not only ourselves, but also all of our allies. And that's how he makes a name for himself. But he didn't like this treaty because he saw that it had some bad economic consequences for Europe. Um, so he might have taken some blame that deserved or not during the Great Depression. A lot of people hated him. But he was forward thinking in the Treaty of Versailles, realizing what was going to come down the road. Um, and I've got there that a lot of senators were opposed to the um, League of Nations. Main one right there being Henry Cabot Lodge who he didn't like joint military and economic action, he wanted to stick to this U.S. policy of isolationism. Well, the Senate failed to ratify the treaty, so even though this was President Wilson's plan, the United States never joined the League of Nations. We just kind of sat down their meetings as well as called an official observer. Um, but when the war is over, a lot of Americans were just kind of thinking, we're sick of the progressive era, we're sick of um, world war, let's get back to normal in America. And Warren Harding runs on what's called a return to normalcy in 1920 and is elected president in the 1920 um, presidential race on the Republican ticket. Um, but some of the domestic consequences, things happened in the United States as a result of the war. I've got that made America the world's greatest industrial power once we had to start reorganize our, our economy to produce all of the material needed for allied, um, the Allied War Machine. Um, I've got contributed to the movement of African Americans to northern cities. Um, a lot of African Americans left cities in the south and went to the north in what was called the Great Migration to try to do two things, escape uh, racial discrimination, which it wasn't always perfect when they got to the north. There was still racial discrimination in the north, too, but you know they were hoping they'd get away from groups like the KKK, things like that. Also, to get jobs in wartime industries. All right, I've got intensified anti-immigrant and anti-radical sentiments among mainstream Americans. That's something you really need to remember. Um, a lot of Americans started to feel like we don't want anybody that's got a radical view of government like communism. We don't want anybody that's basically coming from other countries. We want you know, to kind of stay tucked away to ourselves here. But I've got also it brought over one million women to the workforce. A lot of them were forced to give up their jobs when the men returned home from war. Um, but there were some unresolved issues. Um, the Treaty of Versailles didn't really settle a whole lot. And then this Austrian World War One veteran named Adolf Hitler ended up getting thrown in prison for trying to overthrow the German government. And he wrote a book called Mein Kampf for my struggle while he was in prison. And this laid out his ideas about how Germany got cheated in the Treaty of Versailles and how he put a lot of that blame on the Jews, which obviously we're going to get into when we get to World War II. Um, the Treaty of Versailles kind of sets up Hitler's rise to power, in my opinion. And a couple of things you need to remember about around this time again. The 17th Amendment came out of this time period, which allowed for direct election of senators. 18th Amendment in the sale of alcohol, and then the 19th Amendment um, allowed for women's suffrage. I keep saying those over and over and over in several different note sheets. 17th Amendment, 18th Amendment, 19th Amendment. They're very important to remember. All right. Remember, you're going to need to go online and fill out a Google form responding to this. And if you haven't done so for the last two videos, you need to do that as well. All right. We will see you tomorrow.